Why should anyone expect more? An elderly gentleman with faint blue eyes and faintly coloured clothes, called either Hart or Hunt, Mr. Segundus could never quite catch the name, faintly said that it did not matter in the least whether anybody expected it or not. A gentleman could not do magic. Magic was what street sorcerers pretended to do in order to rob children of their pennies. Magic, in the practical sense, was much fallen off. It had low connections. It was the bosom companion of unshaven faces, gypsies, housebreakers, the frequenter of dingy rooms with dirty yellow curtains. Oh, no, a gentleman could not do magic. A gentleman might study the history of magic. Nothing could be nobler, but he could not do any. The elderly gentleman looked with faint fatherly eyes at Mr. Segundus and said that he hoped Mr. Segundus had not been trying to cast spells. Mr. Segundus blushed. But the famous magician's maxim held true. Two magicians, in this case Dr. Foxcastle and Mr. Hunt, or Hart, could not agree without two more thinking the exact opposite. Several of the gentlemen began to discover that they were entirely of Mr. Segundus's opinion, and that no question in all of magical scholarship could be so important as this one. Chief among Mr. Segundus's supporters was a gentleman called Honeyfoot, a pleasant, friendly sort of man of fifty-five, with a red face and grey hair. As the exchanges became more bitter, and Dr. Foxcastle grew in sarcasm towards Mr. Segundus, Mr. Honeyfoot turned to him several times and whispered such comfort as, Do not mind them, sir. I am entirely of your opinion. And, You're quite right, sir. Do not let them sway you. And, You've hit upon it. Indeed you have, sir. It was the want of the right question which held us back before. Now that you are come, we shall do great things. Such kind words as these did not fail to find a grateful listener in John Segundus, whose shock showed clearly in his face. I fear that I have made myself disagreeable, he whispered to Mr. Honeyfoot. That was not my intention. I had hoped for these gentlemen's good opinion. At first, Mr. Segundus was inclined to be downcast, but a particularly spiteful outburst from Dr. Foxcastle roused him to a little indignation. That gentleman, said Dr. Foxcastle, fixing Mr. Segundus with a cold stare, seems determined that we should share in the unhappy fate of the Society of Manchester magicians. Mr. Segundus inclined his head towards Mr. Honeyfoot and said, I had not expected to find the magicians of Yorkshire quite so obstinate. If magic does not have friends in Yorkshire, where may we find them? Mr. Honeyfoot's kindness to Mr. Segundus did not end with that evening. He invited Mr. Segundus to his house in High Petergate to eat a good dinner in company with Mrs. Honeyfoot and her three pretty daughters, which Mr. Segundus, who was a single gentleman and not rich, was glad to do. After dinner, Miss Honeyfoot played the piano forte, and Miss Jane sang in Italian. The next day, Mrs. Honeyfoot told her husband that John Segundus was exactly what a gentleman should be, but she feared he would never profit by it, for it was not the fashion to be modest and quiet and kind-hearted. The intimacy between the two gentlemen advanced very rapidly. Soon Mr. Segundus was spending two or three evenings out of every seven at the house in High Petergate. Once there was quite a crowd of young people present, which naturally led to dancing. It was all very delightful, but often Mr. Honeyfoot and Mr. Segundus would slip away to discuss the one thing which really interested both of them. Why was there no more magic done in England? But talk as they would, often till two or three in the morning, they came no nearer to an answer, and perhaps this was not so very remarkable, for all sorts of magicians and antiquarians and scholars had been asking the same question for rather more than two hundred years. Mr. Honeyfoot was a tall, cheerful, smiling gentleman with a great deal of energy who always liked to be doing or planning something, rarely thinking to inquire whether that something were to the purpose. The present task put him very much in mind of the great medieval magicians. Footnote 2. More properly called Oriet, or Golden Age magicians, who, whenever they had some seemingly impossible problem to solve, would ride away for a year and a day with only a fairy servant or two to guide them, and at the end of this time never failed to find the answer. Mr. Honeyfoot told Mr. Segundus that in his opinion 
they could not do better than emulate these great men, some of whom had gone to the most retired parts of England and Scotland and Ireland, where magic was strongest, while others had ridden out of this world entirely, and no one nowadays was quite clear about where they had gone or what they had done when they got there. Mr. Honeyfoot did not propose going quite so far. Indeed, he did not wish to go far at all, because it was winter and the roads were very shocking. Nevertheless, he was strongly persuaded that they should go somewhere and consult someone. He told Mr. Segundus that he thought they were both growing stale. The advantage of a fresh opinion would be immense. But no destination, no object presented itself. Mr. Honeyfoot was in despair. And then he thought of the other magician. Some years before, the York Society had heard rumours that there was another magician in Yorkshire. This gentleman lived in a very retired part of the country, where, it was said, he passed his days and nights studying rare magical texts in his wonderful library. Dr. Foxcastle had found out the other magician's name and where he might be found, and had written a polite letter inviting the other magician to become a member of the York Society. The other magician had written back, expressing his sense of the honour done him and his deep regret. He was quite unable the long distance between York and Hertfew Abbey, the indifferent roads, the work that he could on no account neglect, etc., etc. The York magicians had all looked over the letter and expressed their doubts that any body with such small handwriting could ever make a tolerable magician. Then, with some slight regret for the wonderful library they would never see, they had dismissed the other magician from their thoughts. But Mr. Honeyfoot said to Mr. Segundus, that the importance of the question, why was there no more magic done in England, was such that it would be very wrong of them to neglect any opening. Who could say? The other magician's opinion might be worth having. And so he wrote a letter proposing that he and Mr. Segundus give themselves the satisfaction of waiting on the other magician on the third Tuesday after Christmas at half-past two. A reply came very promptly. Mr. Honeyfoot, with his customary good nature and good fellowship, immediately sent for Mr. Segundus and showed him the letter. The other magician wrote in his small handwriting that he would be very happy in the acquaintance. This was enough. Mr. Honeyfoot was very pleased and instantly strode off to tell Waters, the coachman, when he would be needed. Mr. Segundus was left alone in the room with the letter in his hand. He read, I am, I confess, somewhat at a loss to account for the sudden honour done to me. It is scarcely conceivable that the magicians of York, with all the happiness of each other's society and the incalculable benefit of each other's wisdom, should feel any necessity to consult a solitary scholar such as myself. There was an air of subtle sarcasm about the letter. The writer seemed to mock Mr. Honeyfoot with every word. Mr. Segundus was glad to reflect that Mr. Honeyfoot could scarcely have noticed or he would not have gone with such elated spirits to speak to Waters. It was such a very unfriendly letter that Mr. Segundus found that all his desire to look upon the other magician had quite evaporated. Well, no matter, he thought. I must go because Mr. Honeyfoot wishes it, and what, after all, is the worst that can happen? We will see him and be disappointed, and that will be the end of it. The day of the visit was preceded by stormy weather. Rain had made long, ragged pools in the bare brown fields. Wet roofs were like cold stone mirrors, and Mr. Honeyfoot's post-chase travelled through a world that seemed to contain a much higher proportion of chill grey sky and a much smaller one of solid, comfortable earth than was usually the case. Ever since the first evening, Mr. Segundus had been intending to ask Mr. Honeyfoot about the learned society of magicians of Manchester, which Dr. Foxcastle had mentioned. He did so now. It was a society of quite recent foundation, said Mr. Honeyfoot, and its members were clergymen of the poorer sort, respectable ex-tradesmen, apothecaries, lawyers, retired mill owners, who got up a little Latin and so forth, uh, such people as might be termed half-gentlemen. I believe Dr. Foxcastle was glad when they disbanded. He doesn't think that people of that sort have any business becoming magicians. And yet, you know, there were several clever men among them, they began, as you did, with the aim of bringing back practical magic to the world. They were practical men, and wished to apply the principles of reason and science to magic as they had done.